and this is my dog Casey. I'm back again to talk more about nuclear energy. Today I wanted to talk about thorium and how it has many advantages over uranium-235 as fuel for nuclear power plants. When we artificially create nuclear energy, we use the process of fission, which splits apart one nucleus into two different atomic nuclei. However, only three elements are easily fissile, uranium-235, uranium-233, and plutonium-239. Uranium-235 exists in less than 1% of the Earth's crust, and uranium-233 and plutonium-239 exist only when created in nuclear reactors. Solid fuel reactors utilize low enriched uranium, which is 95% uranium-238 and 5% uranium-235. A big concern of today's approach to nuclear power is the large amount of transuranic waste produced by the solid fuel. What are transuranics? Let's look at the periodic table. Uranium, with an atomic number of 92, is the last naturally occurring element. Transuranics are all elements with an atomic number higher than uranium on the periodic table, which are created in nuclear reactors. Now let's discuss thorium. Looking at the periodic table, thorium has an atomic number of 90. The lifter uses the thorium fuel cycle. This is an animation I wrote of the thorium fuel cycle using the Java language in the green foot environment. A neutron hits the uranium-233 atom, causing it to fission, releasing fission products, energy, and neutrons. The neutron hits the thorium-232, causing it to transmute to thorium-233. Then, thorium-233 beta decays, releasing an electron and an antineutrino into protactinium-233. Then, protactinium-233 beta decays into uranium-233, starting the process again. Let's talk more about the safety advantages of the thorium fuel cycle. Fewer transuranics are produced. One of the few that it does produce is neptunium-237, which transmutes to plutonium-238. Plutonium-238 is a useful, non-weapon-grade isotope of plutonium that is required by NASA for its deep space missions. This chart shows thorium transuranic production versus uranium-238 transuranic production. Thorium starts the energy generation process five neutron absorptions away from the first transuranic produced. Thorium-232, which begins a cycle, absorbs a neutron to become protactinium-233. Protactinium beta decays in 27 days to uranium-233. When uranium-233 is hit by a neutron, there's a 90% chance that it will fission and a 10% chance that it will absorb the neutron. If it does, it becomes uranium-234 which absorbs one neutron to become uranium-235. If uranium-235 is hit by a neutron, there is an 80% chance it will fission and a 20% chance it will capture the neutron. If the neutron is captured, then the uranium-235 transitions to uranium-236. When uranium-236 absorbs a neutron, then it becomes neptunium-237, which absorbs a neutron to become plutonium-238, which, remember, is a useful non-weapons grade isotope of plutonium that NASA needs for its deep space missions. This is the transuranic production path when we begin with uranium-238. Note that we began with uranium-238 instead of uranium-235. This is because nuclear power plants use low enriched uranium, which is 95% uranium-238. Uranium-238 absorbs a neutron to become neptunium-239 already the first transuranic. Neptunium-239 beta decays to plutonium-239, weapons-grade plutonium. Plutonium-239 has a 65% chance of fissioning and a 35% chance of capturing a neutron if it is hit by one. If plutonium-239 captures the neutron, then it becomes plutonium-240, which absorbs a neutron to become plutonium-241. Plutonium-241 has a 75% chance of fissioning and a 25% chance of capture. If plutonium-241 captures a neutron, then it becomes plutonium-242, which absorbs a neutron to become americium-243 and curium. So, you see that the uranium-238 base path produces many more transuranics than the thorium path. What do you think, Casey? Fascinating, isn't it? A second 
one safety advantage of the thorium fuel cycle is that when thorium is used in a fluid form, the fissure products are easily removed safely and utilized, such as technetium-99, which is a corrosion inhibitor, molybdenum-99, which has medical uses, krypton, xenon, ruthenium, rhodium, and others, and rare earths, such as lanthanides and yttrium. Here is a block diagram of the lifter. This is the fuel salt core with uranium-233, and this is the fertile salt blanket, containing thorium. Now note, here is where the fissure products can be easily extracted from the fuel because it is a liquid, and the useful byproducts can be taken out. Wouldn't it be great to get all these useful byproducts while at the same time generating power? There is a very low risk of nuclear proliferation because the uranium-233 is inevitably contaminated with uranium-232, giving it a very high gamma radiation and making it almost impossible to transport away and try to make a bomb out of. Although not necessarily a safety advantage, another advantage to the thorium fuel cycle is that thorium is highly abundant in the Earth's crust. This is a table showing various elements and their abundance in the Earth's crust. Note that thorium, at 10 parts per million, is much more abundant than uranium-235 at 0.018 parts per million. This figure compares and contrasts the quantity of radioactive waste in conventional solid fuel reactor with the lifter. This shows the input and output for one gigawatt year of electrical energy. This is the fuel input for both the solid fuel uranium reactor and the lifter. This is the beneficial use for both and this is the waste output for both. Note that for the solid fuel uranium reactor, you need to enrich 35 tons of uranium from 250 tons of raw uranium, put this in the reactor, and this generates 35 tons of long-lived radioactive waste that lasts for 10,000 years. These are all transuranics. It also produces 250 tons of depleted uranium, which is also waste. For the lifter, you only need to start with one ton of thorium, and you put all of this in the reactor slash generator, and it produces 0.83 tons of useful byproducts. For example, medical molybdenum-99, bismuth-213, and others. It also only produces 0.17 tons of medium-lift radioactive waste that lasts for less than 300 years. So... We can see that the solid fuel uranium reactor takes a large amount of fuel and produces a large amount of waste, while the lifter, being more efficient, only takes a small amount of fuel and produces an even smaller amount of waste, with useful byproducts as well. Casey, what's that you're playing with? You know that if this was thorium, we have a lifetime supply! So, I think we could conclude that the lifter has many advantages over the solid fuel, high pressure, light water reactors of today. Lifter has many safety advantages, is much more efficient, and produces much less radioactive waste. So remember, the next time someone talks about nuclear energy, tell them about the liquid fluoride thorium reactor.